Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we have with us an extremely eminent personality, somebody who the state of Kerala almost resonates with. Absolutely forward thinking, an absolute charmer, an incredible personality, and I have the honor of introducing him. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Shashi Tharoor is an Indian politician and, a former and has had a former career as an international diplomat who is currently serving as the member of parliament from Thiruvananthapuram, Kerala, the state that has been gracious enough to host the IAA World Congress. He also served as an Under Secretary General at the United Nations from the year 2001 to 2007 an acclaimed writer and is also the author of hundreds of columns and articles in the publications such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, Times, Time and the Newsweek. Some of his noteworthy books are the great Indian novel, Show Business in India from Midnight to the Millennium. Ladies and gentlemen, the entire social media space knows his affection, love, and allure to big words in the English vocabulary. So I have gone out of my way, possibly sounding a little big than my shoes right now. But these are like a few, two little lines that I possibly thought had some seriously big vocabulary, even to my knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, our exceedingly impressive guest speaker this sundown is the winsome interlocutor a cognizant spirit whose circumlocution with the English language and vocabulary has won him an ebullient audience across the expanse of social media sphere. Needless to say, we're talking about the one and the only Dr. Shashi Tharoor. A very warm welcome to you, sir. What an honor. Ladies and gentlemen, Exception to the rule, he's the only one allowed to cross the ramp as we begin the show. A very warm welcome to you, sir. A louder round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, the show stopper for the day. The stage is yours, yes. Thank you, thank you. I mean, I must say that walking the runway was not my plan for the evening, but this is a wonderful, wonderful group here. Ramesh Narayan, my old classmate, is the one who persuaded me to come and address you all, and uh, I must say that uh, he had a way with himself. He said, you know, uh, you're a liberal politician. You believe in free speech, right? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I'd like you to give one. So here I am for that. But uh, I understand that earlier you've had these discussions about the suitability of the theme of brand dharma and whether dharma is the right word and it's rightly pronounced and so on. You know, these challenges that come up with these speeches are much worse when it comes to a dinner speech because people are waiting for food, they're waiting for fashion models, and then the organizers say, you know, we want you to talk about brand India and brand Kerala. And these are important weighty themes, um, which I'm going to try and dispose of fairly quickly so I don't stand between you and your fashion models and your dinner. But at the same time, you know, one has to know where to begin. I remember in my... Um, old college, which uh, Piyush Pandey also attended, St. Stephen's. We used to have a, a group of people who would specialize in public speaking, debating, and all of that. And we would practice in college and draw up little uh, plans to rehearse. We would write a topic, different topics on slips of paper, put it into a bowl, and whoever picked out a topic would immediately have to deliver a speech. But they had to follow certain rules because we felt there should be certain standards we maintained, and we had various rules of do's and don'ts on how to speak, and one of them was never use cliches, never begin a speech with the words, it gives me great pleasure. So we all agreed, everyone starts their speeches and gives me great pleasure, and so we shouldn't do that. So anyway, various topics were put in. Of course, these were rather mischievous collegians. On one occasion, I remember, I pulled a topic out of the bowl, and it was one word, sex. So I said, it gives me great pleasure, and I sat down again. <laughs> but anyway, that was just by way of testing whether you were in the mood at all. Because, uh, you know, I mean, I, in all innocence, I once asked, um, I once asked about um, uh, 
branding to a, a true profession. I said, look, for a layman, what is the difference between marketing, advertising, public relations, and branding? I mean, how, how do you understand the difference? He said, very simple, he said. If you go and tell a woman, I'm a great lover, that's marketing. You go and tell, I'm a really great lover, really great, try me, that's advertising. If she goes and tells another woman, he's a great lover, that's public relations. And, <laughs> and at the end of the day, if you meet a woman and she says, I hear you're a great lover, that's branding. So, <laughs> so that's the uh, secret of your profession. And since you're all here, uh, I must say that it gives me great pleasure to address you on this topic tonight. And, um, and this wonderfully prestigious International Advertising Association um, to think about the challenges of branding India and indeed of brand Kerala as well. Um, because obviously we in Kerala are delighted you're here uh, in uh, a typically Kerala location, which means lots of green trees nearby, warm weather and good spirits. And that's essentially, I think, um, uh, in many ways, the ingredients uh, that go into brand Kerala. But I mean, let's just back, dial that back a little bit and ask, you know, can there be uh, a meaningful brand India? It's, the phrase became a bit of a buzzword once. I even wrote an essay about it a few years ago. There was a foundation set up once to brand India. One never hears about it anymore. The Brand India Foundation, I think CII did that. Um, what, what, what was, we all know that a brand, according to the gurus, is a, is, a, is a whole thing, right? It's an embodiment of everything that a consumer would associate with a particular product um, and their interaction with that product or service. So it should convey somehow all the key information about that product or service. Uh, it's a name, a logo, a slogan, a graphic design, whatever. And then it's symbolic in the sense that the brand then creates for itself a persona that's drawn upon by the public to define their attitudes towards a product or service. So there's no question that, in fact, if you really think about it, um, the experiences of people with a brand are as important as the kind of image you seek to convey with the brand. And um, I would argue that the only real value of a brand ultimately is going to be the performance of the product or the service that the brand is associated with. Now, given this, the question comes up, is India a brand? What kind of brand is it? In many ways, you can say, how can India be a brand? A country isn't a soft drink or a cigarette. Uh, and yet we know that its very name can, can, can conjure up certain associations in the minds of those who hear it. So Shakespeare may have said, what's in a name? But you ask a country like Macedonia, they've been struggling for 25 years to get their name accepted by their neighbors, the Greeks. And it's become a huge issue of, of, of substance because precisely of the brand value of the name Macedonia laid claim to by the Greeks because of Philip the Great and Alexander the Great and so on, um, which they feel the Slavic people of today's Macedonia have no right to claim. So the name has a certain association. I would argue that there was actually some thought given to this at the time of our constitution being framed, when the entire issue of the name of our country came up for debate. As you know, there were a number of nativists who wanted it to be renamed Bharat, especially after partition. But Nehruji insisted on retaining the name India for the newly independent country because he was conscious that it had a number of associations in the eyes of the world. At that time, a fabled and exotic land, much sought after by travelers and traders for centuries, the jewel and the crown of Her Britannic Majesty, the Queen, the Empress of, Vic Empress of India, Queen Victoria. And all of this, I think Nehru instinctively understood that he wanted the world to understand that the country he was leading as an independent country was heir to that precious heritage. He wanted, in other words, to hold on to the brand of India, even though it was not a term he was ever likely to have employed. Now, for a while it worked, right? Because India retained its exoticism, its bejeweled maharajas and caparisoned elephants against the backcrop of the fabled Taj Mahal and all our tourism posters. 
while simultaneously striding the world as a kind of moral force for peace and justice in the footsteps of Mahatma Gandhi. But as the gap between these glossy ideas and the stark reality of the lived experience of the majority of our people widened, naturally this brand couldn't really last in that form because obviously poverty, inequality, suffering began to dominate people's perception of India. The exotic images were replaced in the global media with images of suffering and despair. If you look at Western publications in the late 50s, throughout the 60s, early 70s, you can understand why the brand became soiled. Uh, it stood in many ways, the word India, for a mendicant with a begging bowl, with a hungry and skeletal child by his side, and was no longer a brand that could attract the world. Now, even in those days, of course, brand Kerala was a little bit different. There was, it was arguably an exception um, to this process of decline in the image of the country, uh, partly because driven by a series of remarkably progressive leaders, um, including, um, including some fairly broad-minded Maharajas in their time, um, and the underlying ethos of social justice and the larger movements of what is today recognized as the Kerala Renaissance, Kerala managed to carve out its own unique brand within the country. Um, that got associated with what in one of my books I call the Malayali miracle, the strong social welfare systems, universal education, gender equality, all of which were comparable to developed countries, strong traditions of social reform, freedom of expression, all of those became ingredients of the perception of Kerala, both within India and outside, and of course, the inspired advertising slogan, even if it was stolen from New Zealand, of God's own country, and serves the Kiwis right for not using it enough. We were able to make it ours. Um, that, I think, represents all of these things as well, and not merely the spectacular natural beauty of Kerala that you see around you. So the image of the state and the consonance with how the society had actually functioned within the state is a crucial aspect of the success of brand Kerala, and that is essentially, it seems to me, an important clue in how to understand brand India as well, because brand India has now outgrown that period of being tarnished by poverty, inequality, starvation, all of those cliches. Instead, the stronger emphasis on development and growth, the benefits of liberalization reforms, the IT revolution, has taken us very much into the 21st century as transformed from a lumbering elephant to a bounding tiger. And very clearly, a fresh brand image has been in the process of emerging. The, um, the uh, India Brand Equity Foundation that I mentioned was tasked at one point with coming up with a slogan to encapsulate a new brand image of India in time for the World Economic Forum's 2006 session in Davos. I think it was six, it may have been seven, no, it was six, where India was the guest of honor. And I remember the slogan was, India, world's fastest growing free market democracy. Seems a bit clunky, but it was all over the place, uh, emblazoned all over Davos, and brand India was reborn. But though it's a, it's a great slogan, is it enough? I mean, Coca-Cola for years offered the pause that refreshes, which kind of told you all that you needed to know about the product. Does fastest growing free market democracy do the same? Yes, our rapid economic growth is worth drawing attention to, as is the fact that it is a free market, because we want foreigners to invest after all, and a democracy, because that's what distinguishes us from that other place over there, right? Which um, for years has grown faster than us. But you could ask the question, isn't there more to our country than that? Shouldn't there be more in the brand? In fairness to the smart people who coined the phrase fastest growing free market democracy, the more attributes you try to get in the clunkier and less memorable the phrase becomes. It's much easier for smaller countries to brand themselves, right? One issue branding. Uh, you remember, it's better in the Bahamas. Wow, what a slogan, right? That became part of the Bahamas brand. What do we want the world to think of when they hear the name India? We'd rather hear, they heard the phrase that I've just mentioned rather than the old images of 
of, of despair and disrepair, but there surely are other elements that we need to bring in, right? So the natural beauty that I mentioned encapsulated in the Incredible India campaign, the glitz and glamour of Bollywood, Indian fashion that we're going to see this evening in Manish Malhotra's uh, clothing, jewellery designs, the unparalleled diversity of our plural society with people of every conceivable religious, linguistic and ethnic extraction living side by side in harmony. That's a, a, a vital part of the brand, surely. And of course, the richness of our cultural heritage. But it would be impossible to fit all of this into a poster, a banner or even a TV commercial. And that still leaves out other things like Ayurveda, IT and God knows what else we can point to. So I would argue that there has to be a more complex story behind the brand, Brand India. And that brand therefore has to be something that underpins our claims to a significant role in the world of the 21st century, which has to lie in the aspects of Indian culture and society that the world finds attractive. We've all realized, and I take some credit for thrusting this into our public consciousness in the last decade and more, that the world of the 21st century is a world in which the use of hard power, per se, carries with it the increasing odium of mass public disapproval, whereas our strength lies in our soft power, which lends itself more easily to the information era. The soft power is not about conquering others, but just about being yourself and letting others see you, see your brand, if you like. And that should not just be the incredible India, beloved of tourism wallahs, but a credible India that we all live in and that the world can admire and respect. Now, country that country's brand, of course, um, partially comes from the elements we project on the global consciousness, either deliberately, for example, through the export of Bollywood movies or yoga practices, or public relations, as we talked about at the beginning, the cultivation of foreign publics, even international propaganda. I don't think that terribly works uh, very well because governments are not very good at doing that kind of thing effectively. But it also is what we convey unwittingly, without consciously intending to, through the ways in which we are perceived, just as a result of news stories in the global mass media about us. So national brands, in other words, are created partly by governments, but partly despite governments, only partly by deliberate effort and partly just by accident, by perceptions. Now, the deliberate effort is important. I mean, there's that joke about the three colleagues in a, in a marketing firm who go to a bar at the end of a day's work and they're given this glass and the auditor looks at it and says, this glass is half empty. And the advertising guy looks at it and says, this glass is half full. But the brand consultant says, this glass needs resizing. So, I mean, essentially a lot has to do with the way you look at this. Now, I'm going to go back briefly to brand Kerala because... Um, it is where you are, and it's also where, as I said, the, um, the uh, elements that go into making brand Kerala can point the way in many ways to brand India. We've got, of course, the beautiful countryside, the backwaters, the greenery, the pristine rivers, the, the decent climate. I won't presume it'll appeal to everybody, but I, it appeals to me. Um, but that really is only half the story, you see, because there are lots of places in the world which are naturally beautiful and that offer perhaps more convenient um, tourist spots to foreign tourists and probably less onerous restrictions on alcohol consumption. But um, the fact still is that, um, that natural beauty and geography are not the only elements in brand Kerala. The social cultural factors I mentioned to you earlier and added to that are features like low rate of crimes against women in the state, practically, practically uh, negligible, the gender equality that was mentioned earlier, a highly literate population, a fairly liberal society, all of these things um, actually helped create the God's own country image and not just the beautiful countryside. Uh, to give you one example, unfortunately, many parts of India, migrant workers have a rough time. They even get bashed up and beaten up, and every time something happens, they're the first ones to be picked on 
Whereas Kerala is one place which has opened its arms to migrants from all over the country who flock to the, search in, to the state in search of employment, a dignified standard of living. And we have, according to a recent study, 195 districts around the country have given us migrant workers from 25 states out of the 29 states of India. And what they see as the brand of Kerala is a strong standard of living, social welfare systems, empowered lifestyles, and so on. And it has created no social tensions in Kerala. Practically none. There was one sad rape murder case which was blamed upon a migrant worker. At no stage did that create a backlash against all migrants. And I think that's part of the strength of of Kerala, here you suddenly find local schools conducting special after-school programs for the children of migrant uh, workers, or, um, or, or actually making an effort to conduct assemblies in Hindi and so on. Um, there are local churches conducting masses in languages like Bengali and Odia uh, on some days. All of these things are testament to a remarkable openness, a willingness to make visitors feel at home. And that, I think, is ultimately perhaps the biggest strength of brand Kerala, not just, in other words, from its geographical wealth, but a way of giving a compelling narrative to the world without actually narrating it. Keralaites don't go out and advertise, hey, migrants, we are a great place to come. But the migrants come and they write back home and the word spreads. And that's, that's. So to my mind, that's the challenge that Brad India needs to overcome that Kerala has successfully conquered, which is that, as Joseph Nye, the great theorist of soft power said, in today's world is not the side with the bigger army that wins, it's the side with the better story. India has, to a great extent, been traditionally the country that tells the better story, certainly by comparison with most of its neighbors or other developing countries. You know, as a society with a free press, a thriving mass media, people whose creative energies are encouraged to express themselves in a variety of appealing ways, and you all know this because most of you are in the creative field yourselves, you know that India has an extraordinary ability to tell stories that are more persuasive and attractive than those of our rivals. And that would be in many ways our, our great um, calling card in terms of branding India. Um, you know, it's not about hard power or sticks. It's not about giving money, bribes, aid, as inducements, as carrots, though we'd like to think we can do a bit of both as well. It's more about the power of attraction. And that, to my mind, has got to be the most important element in India, in India's brand, far more than this business of fastest growing free market democracy, because we all know Fastest growing free market democracy only takes you this far. What kind of country are we behind it? What makes us attractive to others? What are the values we seem to embody and incarnate? That is ultimately what's going to be as important. Because otherwise, China would be doing far better in popular perception than it is. I still remember the Beijing Olympics. Many of you probably saw it on television in 2008. Great exercise in branding China. Right? A wonderful opening ceremony that went on for ages. But showcasing all the wonderful things about China. But why didn't brand China just zoom up in the world? Because journalists who came to cover the Olympics also started writing about the repression, the arrests, the camps in which dissenters were arrested and so on, and the complete lack of freedom of expression. So the Chinese said, all right, we will grant freedom of expression for the duration of the Olympics. We are designating seven spots outside Beijing where people can come and speak freely like Hyde Park Corner in England. The only requirement, said the police, is that those who want to speak in these spots have to register in advance. So a number of people came up and registered, and every single one of them, without exception, was arrested. So that was the end of China's hopes of branding itself. Uh, as, as a great exponent of soft power because people realized that the so-called gesture of freedom and inclusion was actually a cynical exercise in identifying potential troublemakers. And that essentially is, to my mind, the, the great um, difference between a system like that and a system like ours. Um, we have, in both Brand Kerala and I'd argue by extension Brand India, had a pretty decent history of receptivity to those fleeing persecution in other lands. 
We have the world's oldest Jewish community, for example, uh, which, which um, I mean, outside, the, outside Palestine, which came here when the Babylonians just destroyed their first temple. Temple came again when the Romans did the same thing, and they were welcomed on shore and given all the facilities, given land, given the space to practice their religion, live freely. And it is said that when St. Thomas of the Bible, Doubting Thomas, landed up on the shores of Kerala, he was welcomed on shore by a flute-playing Jewish girl. So that's how far back, that's how far back this, this openness goes. And it's continued for 2,000 years, which is why the British historian um, Edward Thompson was willing to write that India is perhaps the most important country for the future of the world because he said every conceivable idea is, is, is present in this country. There is not a thought which is being thought in the West or the East that is not active in some Indian mind. And I'm glad a Brit said that and not an Indian, but that is essentially part of this, this brand. We are playing host to the world within ourselves, physically, culturally, intellectually, and the works. And at the same time, let's stress that, um, that as we look at the way in which India is now being perceived, I think that the awareness of India has become much more sophisticated internationally than any simple attempts at marketing will do. So the perception of India that people see. Sometimes works to our advantage. I can tell you when I was working at the UN, I happened to be traveling in the Middle East of the Gulf countries at the time of the 2004 elections. And I met a lot of Arab ministers, a lot of senior officials. And what was amazing was how astonished they were that here in India, our election had been won by a political party led by a woman leader of Italian birth and Roman Catholic background who then made way for a Sikh to be sworn in as prime minister by a Muslim president in a country 81% Hindu. And the great thing about that is we weren't trying to send an image to the world. This was just India being itself. We are like this only, as the expression goes. And therefore, it becomes a far more credible part of the brand because it's not about pretense, it's who you really are. Equally, unfortunately, when there is violence against women, violence against minorities, riots, misbehavior of certain sadly politically stimulated sections of our society, that too gets reported. That too gets to be the image of India. That too then undermines the brand. Just as the awful violence around the Shabarimala temple has tarnished recently brand Kerala too. So what I would simply say is this. What matters is always the image and not the reality. That if you are anxious to preserve, protect, and promote a brand Kerala or a brand India, what you ultimately need to pay attention to is the kind of society, the kind of culture, the kind of country that you are, because ultimately that's what others will see. That'll be your brand, and if you can only try and focus on being the best Kerala and the best India that you can possibly be, then truly we can once again speak of India shining. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful evening. Jehan. Thank you very, very much. Dr. Tharoor, may I please request you to kindly remain on the ramp? I wish I could call it stage, but it isn't. Hi. Ladies and gentlemen, could we have another huge round of applause for Mr. Dr. Shashi Tharoor? And may I please have the honor of, invi of inviting on stage Mr. Ramesh Narayan to kindly present a token of appreciation and gratitude to Dr. Tharoor. Thank you so much. Thank you.